Some people are saying that Disney's new movie Wish is anti-Christian propaganda that's designed to take our kids away from God. And since millions of kids will watch it and it will permeate our culture, I decided to go see it for myself so that way I can give you guys my thoughts from a thoughtful Christian perspective and I gotta say, there are some things about this movie that's concerning, but it's because of this that it presents a unique opportunity for Christians to share the gospel message. Here's why. Now, as always, I won't be giving away anything that can't be found in the trailer or the synopsis, so you don't have to worry about any spoilers. So this movie takes place in the fictional kingdom of Rosas and follows a young idealist named Asha. In the kingdom of Rosas, there's a narcissistic controlling sorcerer named Magnifico, yeah, worst name ever, by the way, who controls the wishes of all of the people who hope that he'll grant their wishes one day. But after realizing that most people's wishes won't come true because the king doesn't think that they deserve to be granted, Asha wishes on a star that magically comes down to not only help her expose the true nature of the king, but also to free people's wishes once and for all. Now, that's the basic plot of the movie. So why do some people think that this is the most anti-Christian film that Disney has ever produced? Well, the first major reason is that there were a few lines in some of the songs that really seem to poke at the Christian worldview. For instance, we're told that the reason why we look up to the stars for answers to our wishes is because we're all made of stardust and nothing else. Another line in a different song says, isn't truth supposed to set you free? Well, why do I feel so weighed down by it? Seemingly running counter to Jesus' claim that the truth shall set you free in John 8.32. Lines like these came off as promoting an anti-religious worldview, which makes people wonder why Disney would include messages like this into their film if that wasn't actually their goal. Now, in response to that question, some people think that it's actually reaching to assume that these lines were taking a dig at Christianity. So I'll go ahead and let you just decide that one for yourself. And by the way, if you're planning on bringing your kids to see this movie, just note that magic and sorcery are prominent aspects throughout the film. So that's something that you might wanna be aware of if you wanna keep your kids away from stuff like that. But what might be the most important thing to note about this film from a religious perspective is why some people think that this movie is intentionally trying to shape our children's perspective of not only prayer, but also what God is like. So when it comes to prayer, this movie offers a view of wishes that resembles a caricature of what a lot of people understand prayer to be. There's a lot of people out there who lost their faith in God because their prayers weren't answered, and so they concluded that either God doesn't exist or that he's unloving for not answering their prayers. And so now in the movie, wishes are considered to be the deepest desires of our hearts and and they're offered to an all-powerful king who not only hears all of their wishes, but is also the sole person who decides to grant their wishes or not. So it kind of resembles how some people think about God in prayer. But the underlying message throughout the entire film is that if the king cares about his people, then he'll grant their deepest desires because as the movie tells us, our desires are the most important parts of a person. So for the king to reject their wishes is taken as a sign of how much the king doesn't love or care for his people. Now, if you pair that with the popular beliefs in some Christian circles, it's not uncommon to hear that because God loves you, he wants to give you the desires of your heart. So when people find that these desires weren't met, they're understandably frustrated and skeptical that God truly loves and cares for him. Now, while I do understand how how this might ring as true to a lot of us in today's culture, as we study scripture, we learn that we're living our best lives not when we get our desires granted, but when our desires align with the desires of the one who created us. This might be why the Bible says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him and he will do it. Now, this does not mean that God is some sort of cosmic genie who exists solely for the purpose of granting us whatever we want. Instead, it means that when we choose to delight in the Lord and what he wants, he'll grant us the desires of our heart because our desires will match his desire for our lives. And unlike King Magnifico in the movie, the reasons for this aren't arbitrary either. We were created to function a certain way. So we function optimally when we live our lives in accordance with how the God who created us designed us to function. But this isn't the only reason for why a lot of people saw the wishes in the movie to resemble a naive view of prayer. The other reason is because of just how much the king in the movie resembled a negative caricature of God that a lot of people today have. As stated earlier, the king in this movie is a narcissistic control freak who wants recognition for the good that he does for people, and he's concerned with only granting wishes that he thinks are good for his kingdom. Because of this, he doesn't grant a lot of wishes for people because he feels that the people either don't deserve it or he believes that they're just too dangerous, which people like Asha find unfair. So it's because of this 
this depiction that a lot of people are taking the king's relationship to those underneath them to represent God's relationship to us and our prayers. In other words, some people see this movie as showing that God is a self-absorbed controller who doesn't answer prayers because he only cares about himself and not his people. But there's quite a few problems with this correlation. First, the film claims that the most important part of people are their subjective desires. And one of the problems with this premise is that it skews our understanding of what love is. Rather than love being the thing that drives us to give our loved ones their deepest desires, true love is sometimes the thing that stands in the way of us giving them what they truly desire. The reason why is because oftentimes the things that we desire the most are things that are harmful for us and we just don't realize it. And if you're a parent, then you already know that if we gave our children candy every time that they desired candy, then they could grow to have cavities, weight issues, a lack of discipline, and an inability to realize that the world doesn't revolve around them and their desires. So the reason I don't grant my son all of his desires is because I love him. And love isn't always giving people whatever they want, but instead it's doing what's best for them. This means that there's a lot of times when the most loving thing that we can do for someone is to tell them no, even when they can't see that it's good for them. And ironically, in an almost contradictory way, this movie actually recognizes that point because they demonstrate just how catastrophic it would be to allow the king to fulfill his deepest desires of being the sole arbiter of everyone else's wishes. So when this movie tries to paint the picture that everyone should be able to have their desires met, even Asha can see that just because someone desires something, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily good for them to have it. And in the same way, God knows what's best for us, and that might conflict with what we desire, but that's why we trust him with our prayers and try to align our will with his, unlike the characters in the movie. All right, now lastly, and most importantly, in this movie, we've seen King Magnifico claim that he's doing things for the good of the kingdom, but when push comes to shove, we see that he's really in it for himself at the expense of others. He's selfish, self-absorbed, and quick to use his power to sacrifice everyone else for his sake and his personal desires. But when it comes to the God of scripture, God put on human flesh, came into our world, put aside his power, and humbled himself for our sake, even though we didn't deserve it. Contrarily, King Magnifico tries to elevate himself and sacrifice others for his own sake, rather than sacrificing himself for the sake of his people. But Jesus did the opposite. Jesus lowered himself below the angels and became a sacrifice for us. And that's a king that's far more worthy of worship than any bland Disney singing villain could ever be. So is this the most anti-Christian Disney movie yet? Well, to be honest, I honestly haven't seen enough of the Disney movies to know. But one thing that I do know is that even if Disney did mean this movie for evil, we can still use this popularity for good and for his glory. So while this film was mediocre in its own right, that doesn't mean that there isn't anything that Christians can't take away from this movie. With the added caveats that are mentioned in this video, if you or others do go to see this film, then you can use some of the points in this video to not only share the message of the gospel with others, but you can also look for opportunities to engage those who've seen it with an image of who the true God is. The God who loves and cares about us so much that he shed his own innocent blood for our sake and not for his own. Now, much more could be said about this movie, but I hope that this video helped to give you some perspective that you can find not only helpful, but also encouraging. Do me a favor and hit that like button on the way out because it really does help us in the algorithm. And the next time you hear someone saying that if God loves us, then he should grant all of our deepest desires, what are you gonna say? What do you mean?